Hello and welcome to lecture 23 of Math 1B03. In today's lecture we're going to be looking at section 4.4 of the textbook, namely the section on coordinate systems. So just to recap of where we are, last time we introduced what a basis is. And so a basis is a collection of vectors inside of your vector space that satisfies two properties. First, the set of vectors must be linearly independent. And the second property is that the set of vectors in B must span V, okay, written right here. So what we want to do today is look at what's called the coordinate system with respect to a basis B. So I'll make myself disappear here. There we go. And now we're ready to start on today's lecture. So in the first part here, I want to talk about the unique representation theorem. And the unique representation theorem is kind of what drives all of today's uh, lecture. So let me state the, go through the statement of the theorem, and then we'll work, walk our way through the proof, because it's an important proof. So you have to imagine that you have a basis that's been fixed for your vector space V. Now, for any vector that you take in your vector space V, there exist unique scalars, C1 through Cn, such that, and let me finish writing the statement, that x is equal to C1 times B1 plus C2 times B2 all the way up to Cn times Bn. Okay, so let me highlight what the the special part of the theorem is, and it's this word unique. Because x is inside of v, and because this is a basis, it's x has to be written as a linear combination of b1 through bn. That's just the property of being a basis. But the unique representation theorem actually tells me that there's more information going on. Namely, not only can you write x as a linear combination, but there's exactly one way of doing it. So there's only one choice of the CIs that will allow you to write the X. So it's a very special result because it tells you that each X can be built uniquely in only one way from the vectors from the vectors B once you decide what your basis is. So let me walk you through the proof because of the because this result is important for most of today's lecture. It's very important that we go through it. Okay. So, since B is a basis, this is a fact I've already made clear, right? There exists C1 through Cn such that X can be written as C1 times the first vector up to Cn times the last vector. So we can know we know that there are some CIs. Now what we want to do is show that these are the only CIs. Right? And the way we do this is let's say that there's a different set of scalars that worked. Suppose D1 through Dn are also scalar vectors. Such that x can be written as d1 times the first vector up to dn up to the last vector. So we have two different ways of writing the x. And what we want to do is show that actually there is no difference between these two. Okay. And here's what the fact that we're going to use is then the zero vector is going to be the same when you get, oops, many equal signs there, x minus x, right? That should be clear. The zero vector is what you get when you subtract x from itself. And we have two different ways of writing the x, right? So let's write it in terms of the first way and subtract it in terms of the, the second way. Okay, and now let's regroup it. So we collect all the scalars for each basis element. So we have C1 minus D1 times the vector B1 all the way up to Cn minus Dn times the vector Bn. So we've used the fact that B is a basis in only one spot. We've used the spanning property. And now we're going to use the property of the basis in another way in that the, the BIs are all linear independent. Right? So since the 
bi's are linearly independent, that means we have, because, the, excuse me, let's start over again, because the bi's are all linear independent and we have a linear combination going to zero, that means that each of these coefficients are zero. So ci minus di equals zero for i going from one to n. So ci is equal to di for all i. And notice that this finishes the proof because we started with one way of writing x and we said, well, let's suppose that there's a, any other way of writing the x. Here, I'll get my hand tool so you can see that a little bit better. And what we're arguing is, hey, when you went to write it in a second way, you actually were forced to have written it in the first way. Okay. So this is a nice result. And where it becomes nice is now we can start taking advantage of the fact that we have some uniqueness. So mathematicians love it when you find something unique. And this is how we're going to use it. So suppose that we have a basis. And if x is some element in v, then the b coordinates of x are the weights such that x can be written as c1 times b1 up to cn up to bn. So the theorem tells me that there's only one way to write x. And what we want to do is say those numbers are the b coordinates. So they're a set of n numbers that get attached to the vector x. One way to, to think about the b coordinates, and one way I like to think about it, is that you're given the, the basis and you're given the b coordinates, and it's the information that allows you to recover the x. So any vector x can be constructed just by knowing the scalars and the corresponding basis elements. And we want to go a little bit further here, kind of expand on this. If you know that c1 through cn are the b coordinates of x, then we'll write x uh, with a su subscript b here, and we're going to make a vector c1 through cn to store all this information. And so this is called the b coordinate of x. So just to kind of recap before we take a pause and, uh, and do some examples. What you're doing is you have a vector space with a basis. Once you have that, you can, for each vector x, you can extract uniquely c1 through cn, kind of the instructions to building the x, and we can store that information in terms of a vector. So you could also think if you're given a basis and you're given the b coordinate, that's enough information to build the x. Okay, so that's today's kind. Of, we want to today's main definition, and we kind of want to look at some examples and explore some consequences of this in the next three parts.